In September 2023, these 20 countries will participate in the biggest tournament of one of the world's most popular sports, rugby. And you could make a strong argument that one of these five teams will win it. England invented the sport and has reached the World Cup finals four times. South Africa won the last World Cup in 2019. Ireland is currently ranked number one in the world, and France is hosting the tournament. Then there's New Zealand, who might win because, well, they're the most dominant team in the history of rugby, and arguably in all of sports history. And the Oaks are the world champions for the second time. Since 1903, the New Zealand All Blacks rugby team has only lost to seven countries, but has a comfortable winning record against all of them. That's all the more impressive when you take into account that New Zealand today only has a population of 5 million people, a fraction of the other countries that have made a World Cup final. Very unique, obviously, for us to dominate the world because we are a very small part of it. There is a, a fervent following of this team, almost religious at times. So it begs the question, how did such a tiny country create such a dominant sports team? And can the New Zealand All Blacks stay on top? Rugby combines the less placid features of American football and English soccer. You can run, pass, or kick the ball, while at the same time protecting yourself from the combined assault of the enemy. Rugby is a fast, violent, and chaotic sport with many rules, but one basic premise. Get the ball to your opponent's end of the field. The modern form of the game was invented at a school in Rugby, England around 1820. At the time, England had a world-spanning empire, and it introduced rugby to its colonies, like South Africa and Australia in the 1860s, then New Zealand in the 1870s, where it became especially popular. When rugby came to New Zealand, it came from origins in the UK where it was very much related to, to class structure. The elite schools played rugby in the UK. Tony Johnson is a rugby expert, author, and TV broadcaster in New Zealand. Welcome back, and Caleb Clark is in! When it came to New Zealand, it really was the game for everyone. It didn't matter where you came from, what school you went to, you, you had a go at this game. That included New Zealand's indigenous population, the Maori. They formed rugby teams almost immediately, and as early as the 1880s, a mostly Maori rugby team called the Natives played matches in other countries. It was indeed a Maori person, Tom Ellison, who first came up with the idea of New Zealand wearing this black jersey. Those jerseys are how New Zealand's national team came to be known as the All Blacks. And in 1905, they set off across the ocean to play matches, which, when played between countries, are called tests. The All Blacks surprised everyone by playing a faster, more expansive, and far more organized style of rugby than had ever been seen before. They played 35 tests, and they only lost once. A success that not only changed rugby, but also how the world saw New Zealand. New Zealand was starting to search for its own identity. This was the start of it. This was New Zealand. You know, not so much a British subject anymore, but our own people. After the tour, the All Blacks embodied that new national identity by fusing rugby with New Zealand culture most famously by performing a Maori war dance called the haka before every test. I think initially the, the haka was, was a greeting, and so a challenge, and are often performed before a battle. Some people feel that the haka gives the All Blacks an unfair advantage, it's psychological. In 1924, this All Blacks team won all 32 tests on an overseas tour, earning them the nickname the Invincibles. They raised New Zealand's expectations for the All Blacks from simply winning to dominating world rugby. The superlative All Blacks rugby machine. They once more confirmed their absolute supremacy. World champion, the New Zealand war machine, all set to join the other nations who've fallen before the invincible All Blacks. According to data gathered by ESPN, between 1900 and 1989, the All Blacks won 71% of their tests. In 1987, they won the first ever Rugby World Cup. Then from 1990 to 2009, the All Blacks achieved a staggering 80% win rate. When they did lose, they always turned things around by developing new strategies. You know, we're not the biggest people in the world. The South Africans produce these giants. England, a very sort of gym-trained muscularity about them. But what we do have is it's a combination of athleticism, skill, but also be willing to try something just a little bit out of the ordinary. More than 100 years after it started playing rugby, this small country of a few million people was still producing the best rugby players in the world, year after year. So how does New Zealand do it? 
To make this video, we needed to do a ton of research, which meant going a lot of different places on the internet, which you may or may not have noticed has become kind of sketchy. A lot of people out there are getting a lot better at stealing your information, stealing your data, and tracking you on the internet. But luckily, there's a tool that can protect you. NordVPN is the sponsor of this video, and it's a tool I use all the time. Basically, a VPN is a way to securely access the internet via a different country, and it lets you do lots of things. It can, for example, let you watch Netflix shows in a different country. It can also let you get a better price on a product since there's so much variation depending on where you are in the world. All of that alone makes NordVPN worth it, and it's why I use it all the time. But NordVPN has actually become a suite of tools that can keep you protected on the internet. NordVPN also has threat protection tools, things that block malware, that block ads, that block trackers on the internet. It will also sound the alarm if it senses your data in a data leak. It sounds like a lot, but it's all packaged together in one product, NordVPN. They're the sponsor of our video and they've been crucial help as I build out Search Party. And they're offering you an exclusive deal at nordvpn.com slash search party. All the information you need is in the description below, but basically if you sign up for a two year plan using that link, they're gonna tack on four free months. They're also offering a 30 day risk free money back guarantee. I wanna thank NordVPN for sponsoring this video. And if you wanna to continue to support Search Party, really the best way to do it is to use that link, nordvpn.com slash search party and give NordVPN a try. Thanks again, and now it's time to get back to the video. It's the fact that it is our national game, so kids are playing it from when they're small. You know, boys and girls. Alice Soper is a rugby player and journalist. You can be six, you know, uh, so like five or six, and they play something called Ripper Rugby, which is like a primer to the tackle where they have um, flags on their shorts. Ripper Rugby teaches kids how to run, pass, and catch, and it's how New Zealand maximizes the number of people who try rugby, thereby maximizing the pool of talent entering a pipeline that feeds the All Blacks. By the time kids turn 13, they're playing tackle rugby and join club and school teams. Many high schools, called colleges in New Zealand, field multiple teams, again, to keep as many playing as possible. But the best boys play on their school's top team, where the best of the best are increasingly identified as potential future All Blacks. You could almost liken it to college sport in the United States. You're watching Land Rover Fest 15 Rugby where we show you the stars of tomorrow today. Then after graduating, the best are hired by teams to play in New Zealand's professional rugby league, Super Rugby. Only professional players that play in New Zealand are eligible to reach the top level, the All Blacks. It's a way for the team to ensure that there is a constant stream of new players that learn the game the New Zealand way. They have to be all things, so they've got to be able to kick, they've got to be able to run, they've got to be able to tackle. There's an expectation that they will play rugby the way the New Zealand public expect to see them play, which is this rather flamboyant style. Possibly the greatest generation of All Blacks ever played from about 2010 to 2016. Over that time span, they won 90% of their tests and never lost at home. Plus, they won two more World Cup championships. Several players on the 2015 team played at the same schools, and they all played for one of five super rugby teams. Probably the most well-known would be Richie McCaw. He was your typical kind of like hard man, absolutely no fear going into the contact. Daniel Carter, for example, who was like the Joe Montana of the All Blacks. He was a brilliant player, but he was a great strategist as well. But while the top of the pipeline gets all the glory, New Zealand's real advantage over its much bigger rivals is at the bottom. Other countries may have a similar kind of narrow trajectory through your schoolboys into your academies. They just don't have as many people bundling in at that beginning point. It's quite a rugged sort of a game that suited the early pioneers of New Zealand. And these days, it provides opportunity now for young people coming out of perhaps some of the more difficult socio-economic areas of New Zealand. So the All Blacks dominate rugby because New Zealand transformed it into a game for everyone. But whether or not their domination continues is up for debate. Huge World Cup upset. His men are too good for the All Blacks. In 2019, the All Blacks failed to make the World Cup finals. Then in 21 and 22, they lost a stretch of six out of eight tests, which pushed them to an all-time low ranking of fifth in the world. It led some to speculate that the All Blacks were in decline and question whether they could continue to dominate world rugby. Blame was placed on the COVID pandemic and the All Blacks coach Ian Foster. Most importantly though, the losses forced New Zealanders to reflect on how their country's relationship with rugby is changing. A 2018 report found that the number of high school boys playing rugby was falling, 
while other sports were on the rise. New Zealand has had phenomenal success in sports like rowing, basketball, but they've taken away um, athletes who once upon a time would have been all blacks. Like a lot of kind of male prevalent sports, they then start to take on that identity of like real heavily masculine spaces, which isn't necessarily what people want to be around. It's become out of step with younger New Zealanders. And many worry that high school rugby is increasingly dominated by a few privileged schools that are making the game too professional at the expense of the rest. A 2013 investigation found that five schools in Auckland are estimated to have spent $400,000 on their rugby teams, while their competitors spent only 50000 Over the next five years, the number of Auckland high school rugby teams fell from 225 to 181. It's become very elitist with the schools really focusing on the elite teams. What happens to all the players who aren't good enough to play for the first team? Just a lot of pressure when you're 15. So we're starting to see people realize, oh, well, this isn't working out here. We need to be changing things. The most immediate challenge keeping the All Blacks from total domination, though, is the rest of the world. The rivals are getting better, particularly France and Ireland. Additionally, professional rugby leagues in Europe and Asia are getting very popular, and they're attracting a lot of New Zealand's players, making them ineligible to play for the All Blacks. And even the lure of that black jersey for some players simply isn't enough when they think they can set themselves up for life. In England, you've got a couple of um, Kiwis that are over there. If you look at the European teams, same thing there. Japan, currently run by a New Zealander. We put our people everywhere and then we're surprised when they start to know our tricks. So while the loss of these players may hurt the All Blacks' ability to win tests, it does ensure that New Zealanders will continue to remain at the cutting edge of rugby well into the future. Now, even though the popularity of boys' rugby may be falling in New Zealand, the popularity of women's rugby there is exploding, and the women's All Blacks team is number two in the world. Thanks again for watching episode three. This was a fun one to do. To all of you that have subscribed and become a member, thanks so much. It's been an incredible first two months, and I'm really excited for you guys to see the videos we have coming up. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do. If you want to become a member, there is all the information you need in the link below. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in a couple weeks.